The civil war between Gaius Julius Caesar and the Roman Republic marks arguably the most important point in Western history. Obviously, we all know that Caesar was victorious, propelling a Roman empire that would last over a thousand years and whose legacy continues to be seen in modern politics today. But it's also not difficult to speculate as to what Rome would have become had Caesar not crossed the Rubicon and changed Rome's political construction forever. Hi, I'm Matt from Matt's Bookshelf. This is my first video. And today I'm talking about the Civil War Commentaries written by Julius Caesar. The book is translated by F.P. Long and is part of the Barnes & Noble Library of Essential Readings collection. Just for an extremely brief background on the Civil War, its two main opposing military leaders were Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey the Great, representing the Roman Republic, and Julius Caesar, representing himself. Both men had extraordinary military backgrounds, Pompey for fighting alongside Sulla during his civil war and for ending Spartacus's rebellion, while Caesar for his campaigns against the Gallic tribes and his invasion into Britain. The two men served as consuls, although at different times, and were seemingly destined for greatness, but only at the price of the other's failure. Caesar's term as consul is most notable uh, as it gained him the reputation of being a man of the people. During this time, he made a concerted effort to redistribute land to veterans of previous wars who, at that point, were furious at their government for not giving them what they were promised. After his term as consul, Caesar's campaigns into Northern Europe made him an even more beloved figure among the common Romans. As the stories of his many victories passed on to them, like an epic tale playing out in real time. Pompey and Caesar were at one point tentative allies, forming the first triumvirate along with Crassus, and Pompey even marrying Caesar's daughter, Julia. These allegiances somewhat conveniently vanish once Caesar's tension with the Senate reached its boiling point. Crassus died during a failed campaign against the Parthians, and Julia died in Rome. So when the Senate called upon Pompey to be their champion against Caesar, he no longer had any ties to a man who was going out of his way to exploit and disrupt a broken governmental system. And here's where the Civil War starts. First thing that stands out to me uh, in the commentary uh, is Caesar's attempt to write objectively. Obviously, history is written by the victor, um, but at the very least, it's clear that despite their differences, Caesar had a tremendous respect for Pompey and for the soldiers who fight with him. In an attempt to write an unbiased record of events, Caesar consistently refers to himself in the third person as he would anyone else in the story. He does slip some we's, us's, and them's when referring to each respective army, but for the most part, it's written in the same fashion as a historian would writing about these events centuries later. From the Civil War commentaries, we gain a thorough understanding of how Caesar breaks down a war, from the sociological to the psychological, and even to the geographic. This is Caesar's critique of how friends and enemies alike formed in this war. During the campaign in Spain, Caesar sets the scene with Pompeian generals Petrius and Afranius strategizing in their next move as they also consider the practicality of moving legions of soldiers in hostile terrain that they are not overly familiar with. In this excerpt, Caesar writes, the generals favored a night march, holding it quite possible to reach the passes without being detected. Others pointed to the orders for marching, which they had heard the previous night in Caesar's camp. As a proof that a surreptitious departure was out of question. Evidently, Caesar's cavalry surrounded them at night, holding all roads and neighborhoods, and night engagements were to be avoided. Because in, because in the Civil War, when a panic took place, troops generally obeyed the instincts of fear rather than those of discipline. Daylight, on the contrary, a power in itself of bringing before the eyes all men a keen fear of disgrace. The seamless change in perspective is almost alluring. Caesar, writing from the perspective of those generals, subtly explains to the reader uh, that both on page and in battle, he's in their heads. Of course, he certainly had spies within their camp, but the confidence with which he describes the scene expresses that, spies or not, Caesar already had a good idea of what will happen next. The closing line, which reads, in the Civil War, when a panic took place, troops generally obeyed their instincts of fear rather than those of discipline, seems to mark a transition from the minds of Petrius and Afranius back to Caesar. 
It's only a small excerpt uh, in an otherwise blunt description of the battle, but it's enough of an insight into Caesar's thinking that not only is he waging proper warfare against the Pompeians, he's also playing psychological warfare just as well. From the same campaign against Petraeus and Ephraenius, Caesar's exceptional attention to geography is exemplified in pointing out mistakes of his enemies. Caesar writes, the latter, that being the Pompeians, on discovering the impracticable nature of their present site, employed all the hours of darkness in extending their lines, thus turning camp into camp, and this work continued at daybreak on the following morning and occupied them throughout the ensuing day. Unfortunately, the further they carried their works and advanced their lines, the further they got from water. And they thus found themselves remedying their present evil only by incurring new ones. Caesar much preferred letting punishment of this kind do its work amongst them, and so forced them to surrender to having to decide matters in a pinched battle. Even in something so mundane as moving troops around, Caesar valued every move with the utmost importance. The Pompeians thought the matter so mundane that they could not notice something so vital as leaving their water supply, and it frankly costed them a necessary victory. Thus, it was not epic battle that ended the campaign in Spain, but dehydration. But Caesar doesn't point out the obvious oversights of just his enemies. As I said earlier, he's a teacher grading the reports of the students, and his allies are no exception to the scrutiny. In Africa, around the gulfs of Tunis and Carthage, Caesar's own general, Gaius Scribonius Curio, falls victim to the same geographical oversight. While battling a Numidian leader named Sabura, Curio believes he has his enemy on the run, saying, You see, men, how the prisoner's tale tallies in that of the deserters. The king is not here, and only a weak force has been sent, who were not even a match for a few squadrons of horses. On then, on then to the spoil, on then to fame and glory. Victory, however, is not as easy as it appears. Sabura has planned an ambush with the assisting forces under Juba I, King of Numidia, and Curia marches naively right into their trap. The situation, therefore, which presented itself to Curio upon his arrival on the scene only tended to confirm the extravagant hopes. And under the belief that the Numidians were in genuine flight, he left the shelter of the surrounding heights and began a descent into the plain. The hills had been left behind some considerable distance when the utter exhaustion of the army produced by the severity of a march of fully 16 miles, art length compelled a halt. Then at last, Sabur gave a signal, settled his line of battle and riding down the ranks, proceeded to harangue his tribesmen. Nor was Curio less anxious for battle. The infantry of the legions, in spite of their exhaustion, were eager for the fray and fought with all the accustomed valor. The enemy's numbers were continually increasing by reinforcements forwarded by the king, whilst the strength of our own men were steadily falling through fatigue. Resigning, therefore, all hope of escape, they began to give way to those bitter outcries against death which man generally utters in his last hour or else they turned to their comrades and begged them to look to their aged parents at home. Curio and most of his men would die that day in the second battle of Bagratus River. Curio going as far as to make one last noble charge into the enemy before succumbing himself. The campaign was a major blow to Caesar's war effort, and in his writing, Caesar both commends the bravery of his soldiers in Africa while acknowledging a critical oversight that nearly costed him his war. The Battle of Pharsalus was 50 years in the making. Caesar designated several chapters to the buildup of the battle, as well as the actual showdown itself. The attention to detail is well deserved, as Pharsalus pits two of Rome's most strategic generals against one another. To really understand Caesar's love for military strategy, you have to read the book yourself. But it is in these chapters specifically that we understand Caesar's appreciation for Poppy's mind. In fact, to elevate Pompey, Caesar does not shy away from times where he was bested by his archenemy. Recounting an event at the Battle of the Archaeum, in which his legions were slaughtered by Pompey's, Caesar writes, and establishing themselves at the various outposts, desperate struggles ensued on the either side, while Caesar strove to hem Pompeius within the narrowest boundaries possible. It was Pompeius' main object to occupy as many hills in as wide a circuit as he could control. Constant minor actions were thus solely 
for this reason, notably one in which the Ninth Caesarian Legion was engaged. This corpse had just seized a certain height and commenced fortifying it. When the Pompeians took possession of a second hill in close proximity and directly confronting the other, between the two, there intervened at one point a fairly level causeway of communication. According to Pompeius, after first throwing out flanking bodies of archers and slingers, pushed forward a strong force of light infantry, and then bringing up his siege guns, settled down to hamper the construction of our entrenchments. It was thus no task for our soldiers at the time to defend their position and also continue the work on fortification. Seeing his men, therefore, continually exposed to wounds from all sides, Caesar ordered their retreat and the evacuation of the post. It was during this incident that Pompeius is credited with having addressed the boastful remark of his suite, that he was prepared to forfeit all claim to be considered a general of experience. If the Caesarian legion should succeed in extricating themselves from the consequences of their ill-considered advance. No man is exempt from Caesar's report card, including the teacher himself. He acknowledges Pompey's astute military observations as much as he does his own oversights. I won't go into every small clash between the two armies and the fight for the Roman Republic, but the psychological and geographical details that Caesar shows here are consistent throughout. As you probably know, Caesar defeats Pompey in the Battle of Pharsalus and rides into Rome as its unquestionable leader. But you may not be aware of Caesar's brief detour into Alexandria to play kingmaker, or rather, more accurately, queenmaker. After his decisive loss, Pompey retreated into Alexandria, where some of his reserves were stationed. He thought he would be met openly by the boy king, Ptolemy, but instead he was welcomed with treachery. Caesar bitterly recounts the events of Pompey's murder as follows. It may be they, that being Ptolemy and his advisors, were filled with genuine alarm that the tampering with the royal army might lead to a military occupation of Alexandria and Egypt by Pompeius. Or since misfortune usually converts friends to foes, they may have thought it safe to show contempt for fallen greatness. At all events, they first gave favorable answer in public to Pompeius's envoy, bidding him come to the king, and then secretly conspiring amongst themselves, dispatched a certain fellow named Achilles, the holder of a command in the royal household and a desperado of singular boldness, together with Lucius Septimius, an officer of regimental rank, with direction to murder Pompeius, who had served under him as a company officer in the war with the pirates. He was induced to go on board their mere cockshell of a boat, along with a few members of the suite. There, he was foully murdered by Achilles and Septimius. Throughout the Civil War, Caesar continually spared fellow Romans whom he defeated in battle. Cassius and Brutus, two of the chief conspirators who took part in Caesar's assassination, were actually previously forgiven by Caesar after being defeated by him during the Civil War. With the tremendous respect Caesar had for Pompey, it seems likely that he would have spared Pompey for any real punishment for his defiance. But Caesar never got the chance to make amends. Pompey was killed and there was nothing Caesar could do about it. But if he could not make peace, he would have vindication. Despite his generosity to Romans who defied him, people of foreign nations were rarely given the same mercy. In the commentary, Caesar states that he came to Alexandria to settle the dispute between Ptolemy and his sister, as you might know, Cleopatra. Although this may be partially true, context would imply that his interest in the legitimacy and Ptolemy's rule came not from his concern with putting the rightful ruler, the rightful ruler on the throne, but because he desired revenge against those who deceived and murdered Pompey. Caesar would back Cleopatra as queen of Alexandria, and during this next civil war in Egypt, Achilles, Septimius, and King Ptolemy would all perish. And that's my first video for Matt's Bookshelf. I hope you all enjoyed it. I'm a huge uh, nerd for all things ancient Rome. I'm not uh, a historian. I do not have a degree in history. I have a degree in English literature, and that's kind of the approach I wanted to go with this uh, commentary. Um, I would recommend this to pretty much anyone if you're interested 
in Civil War. Um, I would say if you don't know much about ancient Rome or Caesar and you want to learn more, this is a very good approach because it's written very um, dryly, very bluntly. Um, and I think that'd be good for a lot of new. If you are more experienced with um, Roman history, you probably get more out of it like I did, um, such as my knowledge of um, Caesar's hatred for the people who killed Pompey. He he kind of operates under the guise that he's trying to do something good for Alexandria, which is um, partially true, maybe. But I think the, the main reason why he got so um, active in the Alexandria politics was because he's looking for excuse to kill these people. Overall, it's a light, fun read. It's like 180 pages long, so you can get through it very quickly. Um, and it gives you a very good idea of um, getting in the head of Caesar at the time. Uh, I think actually doing a video essay on this really helped me um, with the rereading, because when I, when I was reading it for the first time, um, it came off as very dry, but in going through it, having to look, look read between the lines more closely for doing this video, I think it really helped me. So, I mean, I would recommend you really study every line with like the absolute most scrutiny because there's a lot of the human Caesar that kind of seeps with the cracks here when he's trying to like write as objectively as he can. Um, if you want to get more into like ancient Roman history, I would highly, highly recommend the Life of Caesar podcast. Um, it's on iTunes. I know that's where I listen to it. It's probably on a bunch of other stuff too, but it's um, Ray Harris Jr. and Cameron Riley. And I've been listening to these guys literally for eight, nine years. Um, they started with Julius Caesar and they are now on um, Nero. So that's a long, long time. And they they definitely address, they definitely bring this stuff up uh, in a very approachable way. They're very funny. Um, it's not dry at all. It's really, really great. And I would highly recommend that. Also, I'd recommend the Rome TV show, HBO, on HBO Max as well. It's definitely a bare bones version of the Civil War. That's what season one mostly is. But uh, again, if you're not very familiar with this topic, um, I would recommend going for that as well. We may be doing a little bit of research ahead of time because they try to cram in a lot of backstory within like an episode or two. And I can see that being very confusing people who are not all that aware. But that's it from me. Uh, if you have any recommendations for things I should talk about, um, I'd be happy to listen to them. Have any recommendations in the video itself, I would take that as well. Um, I'm using DaVinci to edit, but um, when you watch this video, you'll know that I'm very, very uh, naive <laughs> at editing things because uh, I don't do it very often. And then we'll see how it goes, but I haven't edited it yet, but we'll see. With that being said, I'm rambling now. Um, thank you for watching and subscribe and leave a comment. Thank you so much. Bye.